That was a good move, Kerry. Just move it up to the front there. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, I'd like to introduce Kerry Terry. I don't think a lot of you, uh, I think a lot of you don't, he doesn't need an introduction. Um, he's been here with us for several years, several years, and he always gives us something to think about. And I appreciate that. I appreciate all those people that made this happen today. Uh, the, as as uh, Christian said in his prayer, those people, the team that cleaned up the the parking lot and the, all the walks. And I was given the comment that, you know, there were some drifts across those walks. But uh, I appreciate everything that they did, and I think we all do, making it possible for us to worship today. Um, thank you so much. And listen, Carrie will be here tonight at 6.30, Monday night at 6.30, Tuesday night at 6.30, and Wednesday night at 6.30. And we're talking about King Jesus, and I'm not, and his righteous kingdom. Is that right? Okay. Okay. And here, my friends, is Carrie Terry. Well, good morning, everyone. If we'll open up to Luke chapter 1, we're going to start there again. If you're uh, thinking, I thought we started there in Bible class. Well, we started in Bible class with Luke chapter 1 and went backwards. Now we're going to go forwards. As we take this week to talk about King Jesus and the righteous kingdom, we really need to emphasize Jesus and see him as the king. Usually when people think in terms of a king, think in terms of a, for every kingdom there must be a king. And to also realize that kings have authority, that you're going to see words this week, that maybe will cause you when you're reading through specifically the New Testament to run into words like righteousness, to run into words like authority, to run into words about submission. All those are themes rallied around the kingdom. You'll come to kind of see them as the air marks of the kingdom of God. But starting here in Luke chapter 1, look down at verse 30. Gabriel, the angel, is talking to Mary. Jesus is yet to be even conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. He says, You've been found favorable, which tells you she's someone who's working off of faith and righteousness, because that's how you find favor with God before you encountered Christ. Specifically, even now, beyond. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. All of these promises that are given to, to Mary about her son who's yet to even be conceived or born, saying, you're going to have a son. You're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be great. I'm going to give him the throne of David. He is going to reign over the house of Jacob, or maybe you think in terms of Jacob's name later being changed to Israel. He says, and I'm going to give to him a house, a kingdom. He says, that will have no end. He says, it's not going to ever terminate in terms of another kingdom rising up behind it. And you need to know that God is the one who is at work here. Amen. Now, as, as this is shared with Mary, to think of having all these things happen to you while you are yet unmarried. To hear a message like that, you might start to think exactly the way Mary went on to think. How can these things be? I, I'm a virgin. And to understand... As it continues, statements like verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. That's what Gabriel tells Mary. I wonder how many times we think about that. Not in terms of getting what we want, but realizing what God wants to happen, nothing or anyone can stand in his way. Amen. Now, as it comes through this, maybe you start to think through the gospel accounts with Jesus. 
times where it talks about his authority. Authority over creation in calming the seas. Authority over sicknesses that you see time and time again. Authority over demons to cast them out. They're terribly afraid of Jesus. And even to think in terms of the authority over death. And to see an authority that comes time and time and time again. An authority that even spans distance. To where he can tell someone that their servant has been healed and 30 miles away, the moment that he says it, they calculate the time back and go, that's exactly when he said it and his son is healed and made well. The authority of just being able to say the word and it happens. You don't have that authority. I don't have the authority. Yet so many times nowadays, people talk about being able to talk to text or talk to have something turn on a light. Realize, does it work every time? Probably not. So to see the authority that Jesus comes with, but yet still to see when was he coronated as king? How did that come about? Maybe you think to a passage like in Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus is riding in to Jerusalem from Bethany. Riding in as Zechariah prophesied about in chapter 9. That he's coming to us on a donkey, on the, even on a colt, and he comes humbly. Usually whenever kings show up, they came with grand parades and people to go before them, soldiers to bear out the path. Not Jesus. Amen. He comes in humility, Amen. riding on a donkey, or even a colt, fault of a, of a donkey. And to come in and the people start to lay down the fronds of, of palm branches before him. They take off their coats and lay them down in front of him. And they yell out and they exclaim, Hosanna to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is about salvation. They knew they needed salvation. And Jesus came to show that he reigns even over sin and death. Now, as he came in, you see him fulfilling prophecy time and time and time again. I want you to look over now, look over at John chapter 18. And where we'll pick up today begins in verse 33. Jesus has already been arrested. He's already prayed that the Lord uh, would remove this cup from him, but yet he knows I'm going to do your will. It's not up to what I want. I'm going to follow your will, which tells you about the humility of this future king. Now, he stands before Pilate, verse 33, John 18, 33. He says, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, when it uses the term praetorium, it's, it's really kind of an, an old camping term for armies. It was the tent where the highest ranking official would be. Maybe it was a general beyond. And so the praetorium had come to be basically wherever kind of the, the highest person in the land would dwell. Well, Pilate's the governor. So Jesus has been taken into the praetorium, the very kind of dwelling of a Pilate. And Pilate just has one question at this point. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, why would he ask that question? There's some things that lead up to it. But notice how it continues, verse 34. Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Notice Jesus doesn't answer the question right away. He says, well, let me ask you something. Are you asking that because of what you think, or because of what you've been told? Now, I want you to stop for a second and think about that for our lives. Do you see Jesus as king from what you've looked at in Scripture? Or do you just think that because that's what other people have told you? Because this is a question that needs to be answered. Specifically, Jesus is asking Pilate, why do you say this? Is this coming from your own heart, or is this just what you've heard? 
Verse 35. Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? He basically says, I'm not a Jew. You're not a king over me. He doesn't think. He says, I'm not a Jew. He says, your own people delivered you to me. And then he says, what we would kind of change to say, what'd you do? What'd you do for these people to reject you so bad? That they would bring you to me and desire that you would be crucified. Jesus responds, verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. He tells Pilate, you don't have to worry about a big physical fight here. There's not going to be one. He says, my kingdom is not earthly in terms of to be a physical kingdom with a physical leader that you see on a physical throne. He says, my kingdom's not of this realm. He says, if it were, you'd have a fight on your hands. Amen. And you'd have to be getting ready. Jesus is approaching Pilate to show him the reality of what's about to happen. Am I a king? Good question. He says, is my kingdom going to be an earthly kingdom? Like the kingdoms of Babylon or the kingdoms of, of the Medes and the Persians or the Grecians or the Romans? He says, I'm not of this earth. Amen. He continues, verse 37. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. He says, so you admit it. He says, so you are part of a kingdom. See, Pilate's kind of cunning here. He makes a connection. He says, so you're saying that you do have a kingdom. And that means you have to be the king. Now, isn't that something that Pilate would recognize that? Now, whether he actually thinks that continually, he's just putting the pieces together. So, Jesus responds, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, think of what Jesus has just told him. I am a king. You're right. So what does Jesus say about himself? I'm a king. Now typically, I, I know we don't live in a society where there is a king. There really aren't a whole lot of countries still left on the world that even have a, a king. Even, even jolly old England has a queen. But whenever you stop to think back through and think about how kings are treated, honor, respect, dignity, and yet here's Jesus, born in a feed room where he's laid in a manger. Amen. Amen. That doesn't happen with most kings. If you look at Jesus, he doesn't come with great physical pomp and circumstance. Yet shepherds show up, men from the east show up, people who have, were yet to even know Mary and Joseph have great things to say about Jesus the very times that he comes to the temple being very young, Amen. not even yet 50 days old. And now it comes to Pilate, and Jesus says, I am a king. But notice here, he says, and I have been born for this. I came to be the king. And he says, and for this reason, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. I came here to tell you the truth about things. Amen. The truth is, I'm a king. Now, he continues on. He says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Amen. So what about if you're going to be part of his kingdom? Is everyone part of the special relationship of being in his house? Now, Jesus reigns over all, all the earth. Amen. But to go, do you want to have a special relationship with the king? 
You're going to have to listen to his voice and respond to the truth that he speaks. No wonder Jesus even says of himself, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And I'm king over those things. And think about in his earthly existence, didn't he exhibit that in showing his authority? But now it's time for his coronation. It continues on here, verse 38, which tells you kind of Pilate doesn't get the point. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. He says, he's not guilty of anything. And his exclamation of what is truth is kind of like that statement you make before you walk out. I mean, he's, it's not like he expected an answer. I wish he'd have waited for an answer. That would have been nice. But anyway, verse 39. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? Now, notice what Pilate talks about him as. He says, you want me to release the king of the Jews? I don't know what his attitude was in saying that. I don't know if it was one of conviction or if it was one of, of mocking. But he said it nonetheless. Then, verse 40. So they cried out again saying, not this man but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. He says, release, release the thief. And there's other things we know about Barabbas. But this is where the people are. Amen. They don't want the king. Amen. They don't want to submit to his voice. They don't want to submit to truth. Amen. Now, the story continues, but I want you to look over the gospel of Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Look down at verse 26. Matthew chapter 27, verse 26. I just want to kind of have these overlaps as we go through the story. So you see we're not making big breaks. You're going to see things as we end the passage and also see them as we begin the next. Matthew chapter 27, verse 26. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So Barabbas has just been released, and now Jesus is scourged. Now I hope you're already familiar with what a scourging is. But the idea was that you would take the hands of the one to be scourged. And they would be tied up and kind of placed against a post so that all the muscles and skin on the back would be held tight. So that it would be ripped to shreds with a whip that had pieces of metal, glass, bone that were sharp. And would just make severe lacerations across the back as it was stretched out so tightly. So Jesus begins now in the drops of blood that were shed by others. He'd already shed voluntarily blood in the garden. But now it's given by others. He's been scourged, and he says here at the end of verse 26, handed him over to be crucified. So going into the crucifixion, he's already suffering greatly. Many people were known just to die from a scourging. Sometimes the lacerations, the pieces of metal and glass, would come around to the front of the abdomen and would open them up, and some people would die even from, from losing what's there. Amen. Losing eyes, losing other things. It doesn't say that Jesus had those things, but he scourged. Then, verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor, the soldiers of Pilate, took Jesus into the praetorium, once again, coming into the governor's residence, and gathering the whole Roman cohort around him, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Now, if you read about it in the Gospel of Mark or John, it's going to tell you that the robe is purple. And don't get caught up in that. It's not a contradiction. The idea is it's purple when it goes on him. And because of the bleeding in the blood... It's scarlet when it comes off of him. If that gives you an idea of what he's going into this with. And now they come to treat him, to mock him as a king. Notice how he continues. Verse 29. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. 
They don't treat him with honor as the king. That's how you can expect the world to treat Jesus. Amen. Mocking. Amen. To think of the time it would take to actually twist together a crown of thorns just to put it on his head. A reed to beat it into his head. And then to spit on him. And to mockingly bow down before him and say, Hail the King of the Jews. That's what you can expect from the world. As you see it here, verse 31, After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him, put his own garments back on him, and led him away to crucify him. They lead him out to be crucified. If you notice, he's not treated with a lot of honor. They bow down before him, but it's just a joke. Some people to this day bow down before him and it's just a joke. Amen. No sincerity of heart. And yet see the humble, suffering king. No violence in him. Isaiah 53 even gives the prophecy by saying there will be no violence in him. He says, and so that in taking no violence, he says, I'm going to bury him. I'm going to bury him in the tomb that no one's been buried in, of a rich man. But yet, if you notice here, there's no thought of those things by these people. Come back over to the Gospel of John. Look at John chapter 19. Look at verse 16. Just so you see very similar phrases. John 19, 16. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. So now Jesus is going to go out to be crucified. And this is the way he enters this path. Bludgeoned. Bloody. To the point where you would have enough blood to turn a purple robe red. Scarlet red. Crown of thorns beaten into his brow. Spit upon. Scourged. And now it's time to go out and die. Verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Jesus the Nazarene. You probably already know that Jesus grew up in the town of Nazareth. And that people spoke of Nazareth as a place where nothing good could come from. Nazareth, if you think in terms of being a Nazarite, meant someone who was dedicated to the Lord. <coughs> Jesus the Nazarite. Jesus the one who dedicated his life completely to God. Amen. And what did God promise about the descendant of David? I'm going to place him as king on the throne. Amen. And however Pilate meant it, I don't know. But he wrote up there, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Remember the prophecy that Gabriel gave to Mary? He's going to be over the house of Israel. Well, the Jews are part of Israel. He lays it out here. Anyone who would come in, the place of the skull was out of the part of town that was kind of like the crossroads to come into town. The places where people were crucified were a public spectacle where everyone traveling in and out would see and say, if you think you're going to be a king, this is what we're going to do to you. If you're going to be a robber and hurt other people, this is what we're going to do to you. I think robbery would be a little bit different in this country if there was a severer punishment for it. And I can tell you, I would be a dead man. 
You make some stupid choices when you're a kid sometimes. Because we forget about who the king is. Amen. Now, verse 20. Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. In other words, we don't care where you come from. We want you to be able to read it. Greek, Latin, Hebrew all of which dead languages now, except for modern-day Greek. Then, verse 21, So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. You can understand their, their abhorrence to this. Well, don't actually, don't actually condone this. Just say that he said he was the king of the Jews. Pilate's response, What I have written, I have written. I'm not changing. Now, I want you to think of this parallel for us. Being a people who are going to honor Jesus, would you write it in your heart where you would say, what I have written, I have written? That Jesus would be your king? That you would bow the knee to King Jesus? In submission and humility? recognizing his authority when he speaks the truth on how we should live and being part of his holy people in his kingdom? If you notice it here, in just a matter of hours, Jesus will be dead. But I want to show you the coronation day. I want to show you when, Jesus, when God declared Jesus as the king. Look over at Acts chapter 2. We're not going to read through everything here, but look down at verse 29. As Peter stands before all these people that are there in Jerusalem, speaking in a language that everyone could understand no matter what their dialect or language that they came from. In other words, the language barrier would be set down for the message of the hope of Jesus and nothing else. Verse 29, Peter says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. If you want to go visit David's tomb, he's still there. He didn't raise from the dead. Verse 30, And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. See, David wrote about these things because he trusted God's promise that he had made to him. If you remember, Nathan brought this prophecy to David, and David took it to heart, that one of his descendants would sit on the throne and reign forever. So now, here it is, a prophet that knew God, swore to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, verse 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That's when you know the king has been coronated. That's when you know he sits on the throne. Amen. When he is raised from the dead, then you know your king. Amen. Amen. Now, Peter lays this out before them. He continues. He says that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his, his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, in which we are all witnesses, as the twelve of them stood before these people, they could all say, we saw the resurrected Jesus with our own eyes. And what does that really mean? We know who the king is. Amen. We know the king who reigns in authority and has power and who dominates, and you have nothing to say about it that's going to change it. You can talk all you want. Amen. Amen. He has sovereign reign, and no one gets in his way. Now, as they proclaim this resurrection of Jesus, to which all these people had heard, his resurrection had been some 47 days before here. What did it all mean? That's the part they didn't know. And so Peter, through the working of the Spirit of God, ties all these things together for him. Notice how it continues. Verse 33. 
Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God. So when it speaks of Jesus as being at the right hand of God, what's it really saying? Jesus is the king. So anytime you start reading through the New Testament and you start seeing, and he's seated at the right hand of God, hear the echo in your mind, Jesus reigns. Because that's the message. He continues, And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And it was quite a spectacle to see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now this quotation comes directly out of Psalm 119. We're going to deal with that tonight. And I'll show you a little bit more that's, that's there. But understand, this also is a fulfilling of a prophecy about a king that would later be, be raised up to be like Melchizedek. We'll leave that for now. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Amen. Know that he reigns. Their response, some of them took it to heart. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And actually in the original language, they said it over and over and over again because of the tenses of the verb. They thought like people who had no hope because they had not yet bowed the knee to the king. Peter, verse 38. So to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You want to be part of his household? You want to be part of his church, the church of the living God? He says, well, then you'll have to come to the king and bow the knee. You'll have to repent. You're not the king anymore. There aren't other kings that are going to supplant Jesus. He points it out to be part of his household. Everyone's part. He reigns over all in his kingdom. Amen. But to be in his household, it is only of those whose sins have been forgiven. Amen. And it only happens by the authority of the king. Amen. And his decree is, will you be baptized and united with the death, burial, and resurrection of my son? Isn't it interesting of being baptized to be united with his resurrection? His resurrection is what points to him sitting on the throne as king. Do you recognize Jesus as the king? Do you listen to his voice to hear truth? Do you humbly submit to his voice when he speaks? Do you see Jesus the Nazarene, the king, sitting on the throne at the right hand of God. Amen. He says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a power to overcome sin even in your life. Forgiven by the blood of Jesus, the blood of the king who gave his life. Then to say it here, he says, verse 39, For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself, calling to be part of his household, the church of the living God. Have you bowed the knee to the king? What's your relationship with Jesus? When he speaks, how do you respond? In the old country, it used to be when the king would come around. Long live the king. It's so good we don't want it to change. Well, it really doesn't matter how you feel about it. It's not going to change. Amen, amen. The question is, has your relationship with Jesus changed? Have we come to him with a whole heart? Because his resurrection points that he sits on the throne. David talked about it. Gabriel talked about it to Mary. Amen. Before Jesus even came to earth. Amen. 
This week we'll take some time and look at King Jesus a little bit more. And then we're going to start talking about those who are going to be in his kingdom, his household, to be the righteous. Because Jesus is righteous through and through. If there's anyone here this morning, if we can be of any aid, will you come while we stand and sing?